Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Matt Smith. I'm the director of training. Our webinar today is entitled Navigating the New Normal. We'll be reviewing some clinical, legal, and administrative concerns that I'm sure many of you have when you consider bringing your workforces back to their places of employment in the wake of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We have a panel of experts today who will be sharing some information today. And uh, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our president and CEO, Michael Combs, who has some words of welcome for everyone. Well, good morning. Thank you for joining the uh, third in the series of, uh, of these webinars. We're really pleased with the group we've assembled today to talk about the concerns uh, and the uh, different topics that we need to consider as we return to the new normal. So looking forward to the discussion and appreciate you joining once again. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to let everyone know that we are recording today's call. We'll be making the recording available to all of the people who registered for the webinar after the event concludes. One of our panelists, Greg Rodway, will be referring to a playbook during his presentation. And I'd like to let everyone know that we will be making a link available to that playbook uh, at the same time that we release the recording. I'd like to direct everyone's attention to the Q&A panel, which you should see on the right hand of the screen. Our Chief Marketing Officer, Diane Blaha, and our Vice President of Marketing, Melissa Storin, will be monitoring the Q&A pane during the call, and we anticipate that we'll have time to address many questions before we conclude the event. And now I'm privileged to introduce our panelists for today. Dr. Madeline Azar Kavanaugh is a board certified occupational medicine physician and a fellow at the American College of Occupational Medicine. She has been a leader in hospital based occupational medicine for 25 years, first as medical director of the University of California Medical Centers, as she led efforts to implement disaster preparedness plans. She was medical director at UC San Diego Medical Center during the H1N1 epidemic and worked to ensure the safety of all the healthcare workers in the UC system. She was also medical director over the seven hospitals in the Mount Sinai University system during the Ebola crisis, and she was instrumental in implementing safety and training measures for over 34,000 health system workers. Currently, Dr. Kavanaugh has been advising other healthcare systems and the public on how to stay safe and prevent the spread of the COVID-19 coronavirus. Dr. Kavanaugh is currently servicing as serving as our medical director for Corvell's virtual occupational med medicine practice. Patty Pryor is a principal and litigation manager in the Cincinnati, Ohio office of Jackson Lewis PC. She's an experienced litigator in both state and federal courts, representing and defending employers in every form of employment litigation, including class actions. She's a member of Jackson Lewis's COVID-19 task force. Greg Rodway is a senior vice president with the workforce strategy practice of Marsh Risk Consulting, MRC. He has over 25 years of corporate and consulting experience, including organizational transformation, management systems, safety improvement, change management, and training and development. And Karen Thomas is the director of case management innovation at Corvell. And she's been with Corvell for 19 years and in many different roles, including a field case manager, case management manager for the DC metro area, and also managing Corvell's 24 seven operations for nurse triage services. Karen is a clinical nurse specialist with more than 30 years of nursing experience, including clinical consulting and business and operational management. Karen was a university educator for nursing and healthcare majors and has published articles on healthcare and case management topics. And to kick things off, um, I'm privileged to hand things over to Dr. Kavanaugh. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, I'd like to go over some of the return to work issues uh, regarding COVID-19 from the medical perspective. I understand that it's currently a delicate balancing act between workplace safety and the need to maintain essential economic activities. I'll try to give you some tools and resources to safely reopen your business while we're doing transmission. Before I go into the details of the workplace modifications, I wanna briefly review some of the new information that you might be hearing about COVID-19. 
now more than four months into um, this whole epidemic, I mean pandemic actually, uh, we in the medical community are still learning about the virus. You may hear the terms coronavirus, COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, they're all referring to the same virus that's causing the current pandemic. We're getting continuous updates about how this virus affects us, the various possible treatments and the different testing options. There have been close to 15,000 scientific papers on COVID-19 listed in the World Health Organization's database since the beginning of the year. Likewise, the recommendations coming are regularly being revised. We're now discovering that there are other organs, not just the lungs that are affected. That is giving us a disease with multiple different presentations. It damages the kidneys, with some people needing to go on dialysis. We're discovering that this virus can attack the heart muscle and cause arrhythmias. It can invade the nervous system, causing loss of smell and taste, and in some cases, brain inflammation. It causes blood clots, which can travel around and damage different organs, causing strokes. It causes disturbances in one's immune system. It affects the GI tract, resulting in severe abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And sadly, we're finding that although we thought small children were immune, there is the delayed disease state with cardiac complications that has been showing up. We're discovering new things about this terrible viral disease every day. In summary, the disease can have multiple and quite varied presentations. Scientists are gathering information and still trying to piece the puzzle together. On the microscopic levels, we found that the way this virus is configured, fewer viral particles are required to infect the host, making this much more virulent than prior, prior coronaviruses. So until we in the medical community get a better handle on this disease, and how to treat and eventually immunize it, we all have to remain extremely vigilant. We're seeing that places that have eased restrictions without putting in place other safeguards have seen spikes in their number of cases. This is because people have a false sense of safety when restrictions are eased and become complacent with social distancing and wearing face masks. As an employer, it is important to continually emphasize the need to remain vigilant and use best practices for protecting the health of workers. You can include reminders in your messaging, posters, and other signage throughout the facility. I'm hoping through this talk today to give you the tools to safeguard persons in your workplace while still maintaining a functioning business. Next slide, please. Um, Workplace modifications. Um, different workplaces will have different considerations. OSHA's published several papers with guidance for industries. We will provide links for these. In general, workplace modifications fall into a few categories. The first is personal protective equipment. Um, most importantly, face masks. Face masks, minimal personal protective gear that should be worn both to decrease transmission of the virus and to decrease the chance of being infected by the virus. Remember, both the mouth and the nose need to be covered. Other personal protective equipment, such as face shields, gowns, gloves, head and foot coverings, may be needed in certain high-risk occupations. We've attached direction from the OSHA website on the various working conditions that would warrant the extra. For engineering controls, the thing to consider is ventilation. Research shows that fresh airflow or more frequent air exchanges will limit the risk of person-to-person -person transmission in the workplace. In all cases, the mainstay in prevention is physical distancing. It's strongly recommended that everyone practice physical distancing of at least six feet. Now, there are multiple ways to accomplish this. The OSHA publication goes into more specific recommendations according to the industry. But to give you a few examples, you can mark six-foot distances with floor tape. In other environments, workstations can be moved further apart, or one could leave adjacent workstations empty. Plexiglass partitions can be installed between workers and customers. In cases where it's needed, masks should be provided to employees as well as customers. These modifications may all seem drastic, but they may be to stay in place for some time, becoming the new normal. Regarding 
an increased frequency of cleaning commonly touched surfaces, such as in bathrooms, common areas, shared electronic equipment, door knobs, light switches, and all of the air pumps. It may be necessary to have a designated person or persons performing these tasks. It's recommended that surfaces be regularly cleaned and disinfected with products listed by the Environmental Protection Agency as effective agents against the COVID-19 virus. Hand washing statements, stations, or hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol should be readily available to both workers and the customers, as well as tissues and trash cans. Administrative control. By using strategies that help prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace, you will help protect all employees. Administrative controls begin with delineating essential and non-essential workers in order to limit the number of workers that need to be in the workplace at any time. Wherever it is possible, working from home is preferred. Another possibility is staggered work shifts. Managers could consider scheduling hand washing breaks so employees can wash their hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds or use hand sanitizer. You could consider scheduling a relief person, for cashiers and, and service desk workers, an opportunity to wash their hands. Discourage workers from sharing tools and equipment uh, is also recommended. I want to stop here for a moment and emphasize that it's important to have employees express their personal health concerns with an occupational medicine physician if possible. Remember, these conversations are confidential. However, the physician can make specific recommendations on possible worksite accommodations without disclosing the individual's underlying condition. It should be noted here that some people may be at higher risk of severe disease. This includes older adults, older adults 65 and older, and people of any age with serious underlying medical conditions. In accordance with the ADA, one needs to see if these individuals with predisposing conditions can be reasonably accommodated to perform the essential functions of their physicians. In these cases, an occupational medicine physician is an excellent resource. Employee monitoring starts with pre-screening, ideally prior to entering the workplace. This should be done under the supervision of the company's occupational health program. An employee's temperature and symptoms should be checked at the start of each day. I want to emphasize that here, Again, the need to safeguard an employee's privacy. Preferably, the screener should be a health professional or an employee health designee. And if in-person screening is not feasible, the worker should self-monitor for a fever and be asked to report the symptoms to the employee health department. To go over some of the signs and symptoms of COVID-19 to screen for, those will be cough, shortness of breath, or difficulty breathing, fever, greater than 99.5, chills, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, a new loss of taste or smell, fatigue, diarrhea, chest pain. An employee with possible COVID-19 signs or symptoms should immediately be separated from others until they're further evaluated by a health professional, preferably by telemedicine. Providing compensated sick leave will help reinforce the importance of not working when sick and thereby spreading the illness to others. Next slide, please, please. If a current employee has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and it has been less than seven days since the sick employee used the facility, you would need to clean and disinfect all areas used by the sick employee following the CDC cleaning and disinfection recommendations. If it's been seven days or more, since a sick employee used the facility, additional cleaning and disinfection is not necessary. We would just continue with the regularly scheduled cleaning routine. But the most important next step should be contact tracing. Information on persons who have had close contact with the employee during the time the employee had symptoms and two days prior to the symptoms should be compiled. Close contact will be defined as working within six feet of the employer employee during this time. Regarding those identified as having a significant contact, those who have symptoms should self-isolate immediately at home. 
critical infrastructure worker who is symptom free and needs to work should wear face mask at all times while in the workplace for 14 days after the last exposure and be monitored daily for symptoms such as fever, cough, or shortness of breath. If symptoms develop, this individual should be sent home to be, be evaluated. A non-critical worker who is potentially exposed but with no symptoms who preferably would um, ideally remain at home or in a comparable setting and practice social distancing for 14 days while monitoring symptoms. Testing. Um, there are tests to detect the shedding of the virus. These are the navel, nasal, now some oral swabs that have been uh, created. These tests indicate an active infection. They're shedding, they're capturing the shedding of the virus. The individual can be symptomatic or asymptomatic and still be infected and shed the virus. There are many of these types of swab tests on the market. There's a variability in the specificity and sensitivity of these tests, which means there are false positives and false negatives which, with each of these tests. There's no particular test at the current time, which has been shown to be 100% accurate. In addition, there are blood tests or serological tests that you may be hearing about. These tests detect antibodies to the virus. In the early days of the COVID-19 disease, individual antibodies may not, an individual's antibodies may not be measurable. These antibodies once produced can indicate if an individual is still fighting the virus, as in the IgM antibodies, or has developed protective IgG antibodies. G antibodies theoretically give the immunity to the virus. At this point, we do not know how long the immunity, once developed, um, will last. If this all seems confusing to you, it is equally an issue for the healthcare providers. We are trying to stay up to date on, the, on this very quickly changing set of information. The FDA has not yet validated any of these serological tests for accuracy. Like other testing, there are false positives and false negatives with immunity testing. The FDA is now working with the CDC and NIH and NIH on the validation project to determine the most accurate tests available. Sick employees should not return to work until they meet the criteria to continue home isolation. This criteria is changing all the time and is different in different states. One needs to check with your local public health department for the latest recommendations. In general, much of this depends on the availability and reliability of testing. If it is determined that a sick employee will not be able to have a test to determine if they are still contagious, there are other criteria which can be used. Employees with COVID-19 who have stayed home can stop home isolation and return to work if it has been at least 10 days since the symptoms first appeared, and they have had no fever for at least 72 hours. That's three full days of no fever without the use of medicine that reduces fevers. And their respiratory symptoms, cough and shortness of breath, have significantly improved. In summary, we need to do everything possible to ensure that workers should not be put in a position where they would be risking their own life and health for the, I'm sorry, their own health for the health of others by going into the workplace. And now for the legal considerations for this process, I'd like to turn the talk over to Patty Pryor. Well, thank you. You know, the only thing people hate more than going to a doctor is going to a lawyer. And it's never good when you have a doctor and a lawyer back to back, but here we go. So we, we've heard some of the medical or clinical issues with responding to this pandemic. And I'm excited to talk to you today about some of the legal guidelines that you need to consider and really the legal minefields that you need to avoid. But first, I wanted to take a moment and say, you know, we hope that all of you are doing well, both personally and professionally. We know it's been a rough two months, but I, I, I have this hope and I, I think that hope is kind of on the horizon there. So whenever you return or whether you've been fortunate enough to have continued operations through this, the workplace and usual employment issues that HR has to deal with are not going to be the same as when you left. In addition to the safety concerns that Dr. Cavanaugh addressed, there's going to be ongoing concerns about a resurgence of the virus. 
continued child care issues for your employees, and just the lax working environments for those who've been working at home, all are going to impact the return to work. In addition, you've got new state and federal regulations in place. And because this entire pandemic scenario is really new to all of us, there's a lack of clarity in the law, leaving a virtual minefield for you as you try to do the right thing for both the business and the employees. As states start to allow businesses to reopen, there's a tendency to rush to get back to business as usual. We know it's important to get up and running quickly, but you really want to do it smartly and you want to slow down. Slow down enough to think through some of the minefields out there and also some of the opportunities. This may be an ideal time to make changes in the policies, procedures, and possibly even agreements that you have. So what do you, what do you need to do first from a legal standpoint? Well, first you need to determine whether any state and local mandates will limit and or impact the reopening and the manner of reopening your facilities. And you also want to follow CDC and OSHA guidance. We expect and are already starting to see plenty of mandates as to how you can reopen with social distancing requirements, policies that you may need to implement, masks or other PPE that you may need to supply, and daily testing or health assessment requirements. So first and foremost, you need to know what's required in your jurisdiction because it does vary greatly. At Jackson Lewis, we are maintaining daily updated charts on these topics and they are changing almost daily. So you need to stay on top of these. Once you're able to return, in many cases, that return may be gradual. So if you're selecting among who can return, you want to be sure to use neutral selection criteria to determine which employees will be brought back. Things such as seniority, performance, or even job classification and what jobs you need may be considered. In some cases, depending on how big of a group you're, you're bringing back and how big of a group you're not bringing back, you may even want to consider conducting a disparate impact analysis to assure that there isn't anything that's impacting one group uh, more heavily than another. We expect many states will require or encourage continued remote work, so consider which employees can or should continue to work remotely. With this, be careful not to assume someone cannot return based on child care needs, based on caregiving responsibilities, or because they fall under the government label of vulnerable population. Vulnerable population groups, the individuals who may be higher at risk for developing serious illness as a result of this virus, is primarily based on age, disability, or pregnancy. As a result, making any decisions because someone might fall into that group can lead to discrimination claims. Also be aware of the many employment law considerations that must be considered with telework or, or working remotely, and which quite honestly you may have overlooked during the immediacy of the pandemic. These things include things like data privacy, workers' compensation, and wage hour issues if you're going to continue people working remotely. If you have a union, obviously you need to consider obligations under your collective bargaining agreements, and you're going to need to, to negotiate or bargain with the union as appropriate about any changes. This may provide you, though, an opportunity to renegotiate some terms. Or if you don't have a union, it may be an ideal time to roll out arbitration agreements or non-compete agreements, depending upon your jurisdiction. Slide, please. Okay. So once the state allows you to return and you figure out who's going to return, then you're going to need to notify employees regarding their return to work, right? So think about return to work letters and the information you want to include in those, such as the return date, obviously the schedule, as well as any information regarding any changes or updates regarding pay, benefits, PTO, any new policies and procedures that you want to highlight. And of course, with any of those, unless they are under a contract or under a collective bargaining agreement, you want an at-will employment disclaimer. Keep in mind that any changes to pay or hours of work may be subject to advanced notice requirements under state law. If the employees were terminated, laid off and terminated, you'll need to send them rehire letters and other onboarding paperwork. Okay? So for new hires or rehires, you need to plan for drug tests, background checks, some of which may take longer than normal due to court and college closures. You'll also need to do, redo W-4s, I-9s, and other onboarding processes. Then you're going to need to decide whether or not you're going to screen employees and or other visitors before entering the workplace. Dr. Cavanaugh talked about some of these, but in addition to um, screening, you might, you might do temperature checks, you might do screening questions, you might, do, um, you might even do COVID-19 tests in some circumstances. 
Okay. And in order to do this, you need to consider whether a screen is permissible in your particular jurisdiction. You also want to make sure that if you're screening employees, that you're screening everyone who's coming in, all right, not just employees of one classification. If they're all going to be working in the same building, you want to make sure you're treating people consistently with respect to the screens. And as mentioned earlier, it's important that these results remain contained confidentially, and the manner in which you conduct them is done with privacy concerns in mind. The EEOC has currently approved temperature checks and COVID-19 testing if it's accurate and reliable during this pandemic. Okay, so that's not going to be a forever, but at least while this pandemic is in place, they've approved those if in it, the COVID-19 testing only if it's accurate and reliable. It is not yet clear if antibody, antibody testing will be approved. So I'd stay away from those in the employment setting until further guidance is provided on the employment side. You also want to ensure employees who are returning to work are properly classified as exempt or non-exempt. Keep in mind that employees coming back may be performing different duties when they return. If your exempt employees are now primarily covering non-exempt work, that may be an issue. So you want to make sure that they're properly classified based on what they're actually going to be doing going forward. Next slide. So now we've talked about getting people back at work. Um, we've tested where we need to test. What do we need to worry about next? So those employees who may not be too keen on actually returning to work, I think is your next issue. Unemployment and staying at home is proving enticing to many individuals. Others are concerned about the impact of exposure on themselves or their family members. There are a number of avenues that employees may explore to continue staying off work. First, as an employer, you need to determine whether the new FFCRA emergency paid sick leave and emergency family and medical leave applies. Remember, these are new requirements that went into effect April 1 for those of you with less than 500 U.S. employees. If you've not had to deal with them yet, you can expect a number of employees to ask for leave under these when you return. So you want to make sure you're, you're aware of the obligations and when it comes into play. In addition, you're going to need to prepare to address accommodation or other requests from employees, as, as Dr. Kavanaugh mentioned. Employees who may refuse to return to work or ask to continue telework due to their own health or safety concerns. Expect and plan that you're going to receive these, because you will. And for each, you're going to need to assess whether leave and other accommodations may be required by the Americans with Disabilities Act, by the Family and Medical Leave Act, by the FFCRA or, or the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act and under state or local law. Even if an employee is not automatically entitled to leave, you still need to engage in a dialogue, interactive process, and provide reasonable accommodations to employees where we're requested because of a medical condition. And, and or you just want to engage in that dialogue to improve your employee relations. There's a lot of fear and uncertainty out there right now. And in what may be counterintuitive to your normal attendance policies and attempts to get employees to work, you need to remind and encourage employees that they should not report to work when sick. This is going to be important and it's going to throw your attendance policies, I know, up on end for a bit. But you don't want employees spreading germs across the organization, which could require you to have more employees sit out or even require you to close part of the facility down. Next slide, please. What else do we need to consider on the legal side? One thing that may be forgotten is to consider training and retraining needs. With many employees having lived and are worked in more casual environments for the last couple months, a refresher on respect in the workplace, harassment, and professionalism may be necessary. You've got employees who've been wearing PJs all day, having virtual happy hours, and who knows what else. When they return to work, you may just want to refresh them on what it means to be at work, being professional, and what's okay at home may not be okay here. You also may need to train on the new safety protocols, social distancing requirements, and even how to wear and put on and take off masks. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the need to evaluate the implications of all your actions to date on your benefit plans. For example, review your plans to determine whether waiting periods will be required, whether you can waive waiting periods, whether under various laws the employees have to be automatically reinstated to benefits, and what impact the layoff or furlough might have on counting service credits under your retirement or 401k plans. And finally, you need to develop protocols or policies for how you will address employees who, who have COVID-19 symptoms or diagnosis. 
just because we're starting to reopen, just because we're returning it to work, doesn't mean the virus is going away. So you want to be prepared for how you will handle reports of employees who are diagnosed with COVID-19. In developing that plan, you need to look to the CDC and the state and local guidance. We started, you know, my part talking about the state and local guidance and the CDC, and we're going to finish right there too, because so much of it is being governed by that right now. And so much of it, it what you should be doing, you need to follow what they're advising. That's going to help you in so many ways on the legal front. So if an employee reports that they are COVID-19, check with the current guidance from the CDC and your applicable state and be aware that these have changed several times. You know, the, the, the process that Dr. Kavanaugh laid out in terms of what you currently look for has changed several times already to get to this point. So it, it's certainly possible it will change again. <clears throat> and, then, and then you, so you determine from that when can the infected employee return to work and also what type of contact tracing you need to undertake and who should be asked to self-quarantine for 14 days because they may have been exposed, currently meaning they've been in close contact within six feet for 10 minutes or more with that infected employee. So that's a very quick overview of some of the legal considerations as we hopefully start to turn the corner. I'm now going to turn this over to Greg Rodway, who's going to talk about some of the practical things you need to consider in the return to work playbook. Thanks very much, Patty. And thanks also to Dr. Kavanagh. Both have provided a very interesting overview of the medical and the legal implications of the COVID-19 response. And in both of their presentations, they made it clear that it is a developing and emerging situation and that um, as things change, you need to be aware of uh, what's going on and then make plans to address those changes. I think Patty made a very good point too when she was speaking about the need to slow down because what I'm going to talk about is um, a return to work approach, which includes some time to do some reflection and make sure you're not creating new problems when responding to COVID-19. Now, as Matt talked about, uh, Marsh Risk Consulting have developed a guidebook, a playbook, which is being released uh, this week. And I uh, will be providing information to Matt and he'll be able to provide it to you. It's called Returning People to the Workplace Safely. And as I said, it will be available for download from the marsh.com server. Now it covers issues that were previously addressed by Dr. Kavanagh and also by Patty. So I don't intend to uh, go through those issues again, things like screening, physical distancing, sanitization, and more broadly issues around safety, culture, and behavior. But uh, what I wanted to do is to bring your attention to the playbook and the approach it takes, which is different to a purely medical or a purely legal approach. But it really looks at risk management more broadly in the context of identifying hazards, reviewing controls and making improvements as necessary. So you may ask the question, well, what is a hazard in this context? Clearly, the presence of COVID-19 in the workplace is a hazard or at least the potential for infection by COVID-19 in the workplace is a hazard that needs to be controlled. But um, a hazard can be something which is causing a risk to your employees and that they have an exposure to that. For instance, in the response to the COVID-19 presence, it could be associated with new chemicals. It could also be associated with combination of chemicals which you're using for sanitization. Alternatively, it could be associated with the use of new equipment, for instance, respirators or new manufacturing equipment, which has different forms of guarding. It could also relate to new procedures, for instance, with physical distancing, the way the work is done, it may introduce new hazards to the environment, either they're physical or they could be ergonomic musculoskeletal risks. Thinking about working from home is also a challenging area and may introduce new hazards because uh, people aren't used to working from home and it looks like uh, the working from home, which was called temporary working from home, may be, become uh, not necessarily temporary, perhaps even uh, 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 the new norm. So that being the case, there are some ergonomic challenges which exist in the home environment, which you need to consider. So these are all new forms of hazards. And the next question to really ask is, well, what controls are in place to manage these hazards? For instance, if I'm introducing new chemicals, do we have the safety data sheets at hand that are necessary? Are people trained in the use of PPE? And are there plans in place for people working from home? Finally, you then ask the question, are these controls effective? If they're ineffective or incomplete, then it's necessary for you to put in place a plan to decide how to address these hazards. 
when you do implement them, then you need to check to see how effective they are. So having spoken about the hazards, the controls and the plan to do it, well, where would you begin? And I think this is where the, the return to work playbook really comes into its own because to help you understand and identify where to start, the playbook does include a return to work assessment. So what we would suggest you do is to uh, look at the playbook, look at the assessment. There are 23 questions and then answer each question to identify gaps. Now the questions do speak to screening, uh, contact reduction, sanitization, the use of chemicals and uh, equipment safety. Plus there are some questions around ergonomics, but more broadly it asks questions around how does the response impact your emergency action planning? Maybe you've not thought about that, which was Paddy's point about slowing down. There are questions about communications and engagement, questions about a return to work training, and also incident review. Again, you may not have considered this, but if an incident does occur because of a breakdown in the control, are you able to understand why it occurred? Are you able to then share that reasoning, put in place improvements and prevent it from happening again? Another thing you may not have thought about is doing an audit of your re return to work response. This will allow you to confirm whether the plans you have put in place are actually being implemented or not, and also identify areas where you need to make changes to those plans, which is the concept of a management review. There is also questions about safety culture and whether people are being um, distracted in the workplace. And that may be because of things outside of work or not, but the issue is there is a predominance when people are distracted that they will have an incident. Plus, as COVID-19 response isn't going to be something going away tomorrow or in the next week or in the next month, it's really important also to align your COVID-19 response with your more broader safety management system to make sure that you're not creating additional problems through a misalignment. One other thing that the assessment asks you to consider is how are you organised to respond to the COVID-19 presence? And we suggest that uh, you would look at uh, developing or implementing a pandemic support team made up of key people in your organisation who have authority to commit the organisation, for instance, to the purchasing of PPE, but also to see through the changes which need to be put in place. At that stage, it's now time to look through the playbook. And I would also have to emphasise, especially what uh, Dr. Kavanaugh was talking about, and also as Patty was describing the legal implications, this is an emerging and developing situation. So consequently, it's very important that you get the latest guidance and to reach out and engage with your legal, medical and other advisors to help you understand what the current situation is and to make appropriate decisions. Next slide, please. So once you've done your assessment, you've read the playbook, you've now put together a plan, you're looking at the highest priorities, it's important to remain flexible. Remember that nimbleness is essential in the response to COVID-19. So you will have a plan and you will start to implement the plan, but the pandemic support team should keep an eye on what's happening inside and outside of your organisation. And then as necessary changes are required to make them to your plan, and to then implement it and then to audit the effectiveness of your plan. You know, it's really important that you take this approach to look at hazards because it gives you a framework to understand how effective your controls are and also to give you some insight into where there may be areas that you're missing. As you continue to close a gap, then you can move on to the next one, which is of a lower priority and continue working through the list of actions that you've identified in your plan so that you continue to improve. So I would uh, suggest that you uh, look at uh, the, the notes that you'll be receiving for the link to the playbook. And uh, I'll now pass on to Karen Thomas to continue the presentation. Thanks, Karen. Thanks so much, Greg. And uh, thank you to Dr. Kavanaugh and Patty for their wonderful information as well. You know, it's really hopeful to begin to talk about return to work and to do something proactive rather than waiting, but it's also a very dangerous time um, as we help workers navigate the new normal. 
our mutual goals together need to be to commit to decreasing transmission among employees, maintaining healthy business operations and workplace environments, and supporting overall good health among our employees. Um, certainly, Dr. Kavanaugh, Patty, and Greg have provided the medical, legal, and risk management perspectives on resuming work operations under the COVID shadow. Really great information. And considering their expert advice, employers are going to need to stay current with state and local orders um, and the guidelines from CDC and OSHA, which each of our experts pointed out are constantly changing. Um, as we learn more about the virus. We also have to provide employee education on COVID and work safety, and we have to provide ongoing clear communication um, as to public health expectations to the workforce so they have a good understanding. Um, and then we need to assess employee health on an ongoing basis. Um, this is certainly a lot to take on as an employer, but Corvell is here to help you manage this process. Next slide, please, Matt. So our uh, nurses can complete COVID screenings based on the latest CDC and OSHA guidelines. The screening tools include temperature, system, and travel questions. We certainly have the ability to customize these screen tools as you might need. Um, our registered nurses document assessments and instruction and the employee understanding. And we stress the importance of staying at home when sick. Very, very important so we don't infect the rest of the workforce. It's critical, as you heard from Patty um, and Dr. Kavanaugh, that we keep this medical information confidential um, under the ADA. Corvell can also provide on-site temperature taking so temperature taking should be conducted by properly trained personnel using appropriate personal protective equipment. This is going to ensure consistency, privacy, and then lack of exposure to other employees. Um, our registered nurses can complete training sessions. That can happen once or on an ongoing basis. Um, I saw a question in the chat pane about how to uh, wear masks, how to take care of masks, remove masks. Very important that your employees have a good understanding of um, personal protective equipment, how to use it, good hand washing, um, social distancing. Respiratory etiquette, that is a thing now. Really cool to be on point with your respiratory etiquette. Um, COVID symptoms, and again, the importance of staying home at any indication of illness. Um, for your equipment needs, our Care IQ team can work to source thermometers, um, PPE, hand sanitizer, very difficult to find uh, these types of equipment, um, and we can help you with that and also ensure uh, good pricing. For the workers who test COVID positive, our nurses can perform daily wellness checks to assess for escalation of COVID symptoms. Um, we utilize a very specific COVID protocol, uh, which is based again on the CDC guidelines. We can connect with your employers via, via video feeds or audio calls. So very effective to use video chats. The nurses like to do that to make the connection um, with humans and then also to complete assessments, be able to look at skin and fatigue and body language, all those good things that really help our clinicians make best decisions. We also can uh, take the opportunity during these wellness checks to provide ongoing patient education on symptom management and the importance of uh, just good health practices that combat the virus and mitigate its effects. So nutrition, rest, sunshine, fresh air, uh, good mental health practices to combat um, isolation, anxiety, depression. For more severe cases, our nurse case managers can assist with discharge planning, and that can include uh, arranging durable medical equipment, um, uh, uh, initiating care, um, 
any of the things that uh, your workers might need as they recover from perhaps severe complications of the awful virus. And we don't want to forget the workers who are injured on the job who uh, have not tested COVID positive. So very important to keep the recovery moving forward. We offer 24 seven triage hotline um, and that, can, that does include telemedicine. So for those, uh, those employees also who are not comfortable or for their own primary care physicians that do not offer telemedicine, we can put them in touch with occupational health specialists to continue their care and again, promote uh, restoration of function. Our nurse case managers certainly are experts at uh, navigating the complicated healthcare landscape that COVID has produced. So they're very connected to their communities, well-versed in care options. And again, this keeps the uh, injured worker on the road to recovery, despite all the hurdles and barriers that COVID has um, kindly provided to us. We, uh, as a tool, offer to our case managers a app for prehab and rehab for certain musculoskeletal surgical procedures um, or even to address acute or chronic back pain. And this, again, helps injured workers be proactive in their approach to recovery, keep things moving forward. Um, and finally, we can offer cognitive behavior therapy for injured workers that might benefit from support for pain, anxiety, attitude, belief management um, to achieve full restoration to recovery. So we have many options to assist you. You certainly aren't alone in this. Um, and we would welcome the opportunity to partner and help keep your workforce safe as you return back to full function. And with that, I will turn it over to Diane Blaha to begin the Q&A session. Thank you, Karen, and thank you to all the panelists. Some great information to share with the group today. We did ask for questions uh, for those who are registering, and we did get some in the chat pane. We'll try to get through as many as possible. First question I'm going to direct to Patty. Uh, will employees be paid by their employer for any lost time as a result of either a mandated quarantine or the time it takes until they can resume working once, once the area is sanitized? Great question. And a lot of my answers are going to be it depends. And this one is it depends. So you'll need to check with your um, state um, laws in terms of whether it's a paid sick leave that might be available. Or if you are under 500 employees or a public employer where you're subject to the new Families First Coronavirus Response Act, then you may have to under FFCRA, either as emergency paid sick leave or emergency FMLA leave both of which have a pay requirement to them. So there might be an opportunity there that you would require to. Otherwise, it depends on the employer and their policies and procedures, how they want to handle that. Great. Thank you very much. A question for Greg. What is the biggest challenge you can foresee for employers when dealing with at-home injuries, at-home uh, work injuries? Um, I, would, um, I would look at that from the perspective of uh, the ergonomic um, potential for a musculoskeletal injury. Um, you know, I would, um, I know that um, uh, it's more advanced than in the office because it's a less controlled environment. Also, it's not a standard set of equipment. So um, uh, without the oversight also, it's challenging. So um, um, I would uh, look at um, ways that employers could uh, work with their, with their people that are working remotely, partner with them, um, so that they're more, more aware of the ergonomic challenges that they face working from a home environment and um, uh, wherever it's possible to then provide some guidance or some training to people working remotely on what good practices are. Because I think from the risk management perspective, what we're looking for is to develop um, avoidance and uh, to prevent injuries from occurring. And the best way to do that is to be proactive about it. So, um, you know, helping people understand where their where the hazards are and providing advice is is a good starting point. But whether I could just also pass it over to Patty too, because there are some some uh, issues here. There's blurred lines about reporting injuries, isn't there? And uh, some other other complicating factors, which uh, uh, really are beyond uh, like an ergonomic uh, perspective or assessment, but really speak to um, you know the opportunity to do incident investigation in a remote location. Uh, maybe Patty, could you just uh, maybe shed some light on that too, please? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly it's certainly possible that you would need to um, you know investigate and and respond to it again. It's going to depend on on the state jurisdiction. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate those responses. Uh, this question is for Dr. C. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh, CDC and EEOC have aligned with temperatures greater than 100 degree Fahrenheit and no work. You stated 99.5. Can you give us a little bit of insight into your thought? You know, the, that is just a screening, a screening temperature. Um, if someone has a low grade fever, um, it would be good then for them to talk to a medical professional about any other symptoms that they may be having uh, to discern whether they are um, you know, it, um, having potentially having early signs of COVID-19. I set the bar a little low there because most of the temperature screenings that are being done are done by those um, uh, forehead screening devices and your temperature with a forehead screening device is a little bit lower than it would be with an oral temperature as well and could be affected by, you know, if you're just coming in from outside. So it's just to give you a little wiggle room. Uh, you know, these people are not immediately sent home but are, you know, um, advised to then call up the telehealth uh, provider and symptoms that they might be having or anything else that might be happening. So that's, uh, that's where I went with that. And, and if I could just add on to that, there are some states that actually do set the bar at 99.5. So again, you'll want to check your, you your local state. Good, good advice. Thank you very much. Uh, this question is for Karen from the chat pane. Uh, will you provide wellness checks for employees even if the virus was not work related? Yes, we can absolutely do that. We can we can absolutely provide wellness checks uh, no matter how um, it is uh, contacted. Great. Thank you, Karen. Uh, this question is for Patty. Uh, in an open concept office, how close is too close for people to be working near one another? Does the six foot rule still apply or does it need to be a greater distance? It's, it's still the six foot rule, generally speaking, um, but with those open concept offices, you, you need to be a little more careful and think through how you're going to make sure that employees actually stay more than six feet away, right? It's very easy to start kind of gravitating toward each other. And so in those kind of situations, you might want to consider physical barriers, even if they're temporary, you might want to consider putting up some some plexiglass or other um, barriers just to kind of provide some extra protection and extra separation there. But it, it's still generally, it's a, it's a six foot um, radius around you that you want to make sure um, people are protected. Great, thank you. And um, this question is for Dr. Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh, do you see any increased exposure to injured workers that go to a physical clinic versus using telemedicine or virtual medicine? What are options considering the California regulations for requiring some treatment to be entirely by telemedicine or virtual? Um, it, it's hard to do a lot of questions. Yes, it is. Well, regarding telemedicine, most things can be done, handled through telemedicine. We can order x-rays remotely. We can um, get physical therapy if that's needed. We could do a, a virtual exam, but if, if it's needed, um, they would they would be directed into a brick and mortar facility, uh, but I think to keep as many people out of the brick and mortar facilities as possible, especially at this time, is is the safest thing to do. So as as much as possible, if the, at least the initial screen could be done by telemedicine, and then determine whether it is urgent um, or indicated that the person go to a brick and mortar facility as a follow up. Great, thank you very much. Another question for Patty. This is an interesting one. Is an employer responsible for providing PPE? It depends. So it, it will again depend on your state. <laughs> it's the lawyer answer for everything. It, it, it will depend somewhat on your state. So some states are requiring as part of their um, require required opening um, requirements that employers actually provide and, and when you say PPE I would not consider masks PPE necessarily 
but um, these cloth face coverings, some states are requiring that employers pay for those and provide those. Some are also requiring gloves and other things that the employer provide. Um, depending on what the purpose of the, of the, of the equipment is, um, employers may or may not have to provide it, but I do think in, in most cases it's a good idea to do it to make sure you've got employees wearing proper equipment and proper um, things. I also think if you're not yet opening and you're considering opening soon, you might want to start sourcing those because just like toilet paper, masks are very hard to come by right now. So you want to, you might want to start sourcing those now so you're prepared when you're able to open. Great. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Karen, a question for you. In light of so many of our service employees having been out of work for the past two plus months, there's a concern that many of them have become deconditioned during this time. As a result, there is an expectation that we'll see an uptick in sprain strain injuries in the weeks after reopening. Does Corvell anticipate the same increase in newly reported claims? And if so, what are you doing to prepare for this increase? And what steps would you recommend that employers take to mitigate these new types of injuries? Great question. So, yes, um, we do anticipate seeing an uptick in strain sprains um, given these months of kind of inactivity, uh, sourdough bread and Netflix for sure. Um, so what uh, we are doing is encouraging employers to begin by educating um, their workforce, uh, the experts, I think, across the board mentioned the, the importance of training and retraining. So all of those body mechanics we need to review again, ergonomic assessments as we're moving workstations and, and resetting new workplaces um, for our workforce, even people who are working from home, important um, not to kind of adopt the out of sight, out of mind with them. We need to ensure that they are working safely and efficiently. Um, we also want to uh, promote good overall health. So as we begin to start to think about returning people to work, um, it's not too soon to begin to talk about just overall health with your EPA programs, incorporating them into the plan. Um, I mentioned nutrition, good mental health practices, rest, very critical as we're all combating this, this new virus world that we're paying attention to that. And then finally, I would also put an effort um, towards pointing out that we are all under a great deal of stress. So as workers begin to think about coming back, stress can often lead to distraction, which then leads in turn to injuries, strains and sprains. So we wanna help the workforce understand how important it is to be mindful with everything that they're doing. Great, thank you, Karen. Uh, Dr. C, another question for you. What if an employee checks off cough, shortness of breath, muscle pain, and was exposed to someone with a sore throat and headache, but says his symptoms are from smoking? Well, that's, that's the reason that you need a medical provider. Um, so the medical provider, um, that, the, those questions and answers should be reviewed by a medical professional and a medical provider who could go into more detail and determine whether it, it, it's um, consistent with COVID-19 or with something else. Many of the symptoms of COVID-19 could be from other uh, etiologies. So it, it really is important to have uh, any of the positives being reviewed by a medical professional and not by a, not, by a lay person. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. Um, Patty, last question, I, we're kind of running out of time here, but I'll toss the last question over to you. Uh, some uh, hesitation or maybe confusion. Are employers required to monitor temperatures upon arrival to work? Guess what? It depends. <laughs> so it it it, <laughs> it, it, it does I'm again. <laughs> it does again depend on those state um, those state um, opening orders. And again, that's that's why one of the things we're doing at Jackson Lewis is monitoring those, literally updating them every couple of hours because it changes that quickly. But so some states are requiring that employers um, do temperature checks. Others are not. Um, in many cases, they will allow either the employer to do it or you can have the employee do it. Um, I personally am, am a big fan of having the employee do their own temperature check unless you've got, you know, a nurse or someone else 
else who can actually perform it for you. I think it just puts a little too much risk of, and too many people in one closed space otherwise. Um, but so some will allow you either to do it yourself where you're actually performing it or have your employees do it at home. You may have to pay employees for that time. And certainly if you're doing it at site, you're going to have to pay employees for that time that they're waiting in line to take their temperature or for the time of the temperature check, even if they haven't clocked in yet. So you want to be cautious of that. Um, but it, it does depend on the, the state, whether you're required or not. Thank you, and thank you for all of the uh, questions submitted, both in the chat pane and prior to the session. I'll turn this back over to you, Matt. Thank you, Diane. I'd like to thank our panelists today, Greg, Patty, Karen, and Dr. Kavanaugh, for sharing your information and your expertise with all of us. I'd like to thank Melissa and Diane for hosting and developing the presentation today and for monitoring all of the incoming questions. I'd also like to thank all of you for spending part of your day with us and attending this webinar. Just as a reminder, we will be releasing a uh, recording of the webinar and sending out a link to the recording to all of the people who registered for today's event, as well as a link to the playbook on the Marsh website that Greg referenced during his presentation. Thanks again. We wish you all well, stay safe and healthy, and enjoy the rest of your day.